All right, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll begin. Lord, we thank you for our time together, and I pray that you'll uh, enlighten us and help us to uh, uh, to walk more closely with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, we have two chapters tonight. The first one is on Christian marriage, and the next one's on forgiveness. <laughs> Coincidence? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> it, it's not your fault they came together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I think that may have been uh, by design. <laughs> Joanne's going to try. Okay, so uh, chapter six, Christian marriage, uh, begins. The last chapter was mainly negative which was on uh, chastity. I discussed what was wrong with the sexual impulse in man, but said very little about its right working, in other words, about Christian marriage. And, uh, and there where he talked about the Christian viewpoint on chastity is uh, uh, either uh, sex within marriage or complete chastity. <clears throat> um, First, uh, Christian doctrine on this subject is extremely unpopular. And uh, he also acknowledges that when he wrote this book, he had, he was not, had never been married, uh, but he did marry later, uh, later on. The Christian idea of marriage is based on Christ's words that a man and wife are to be regarded as a single organism, for that is what the words one flesh would be in modern English. He is not expressing a sentiment, but stating a fact. Well, answer, that six times. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so so uh, this this is given to us as just a fact that uh, the two shall become one, and he uses the example of a uh, a violin and a bow. That, that that is one instrument, even though there's there's two different things. Each is useless without the other. Um, the monstrosity of sexual intercourse outside marriage is that those who indulge in it are trying to isolate one kind of union, the sexual, from all the other kinds of union which were intended to go along with it and make it a total union. Uh, the Christian attitude does not mean that there is anything wrong with sexual pleasure any more than about the pleasure of eating. It means that you must not isolate that pleasure and try to get it by itself. Um, so that's that's what he's he's pointing out that um, uh, you know if you're trying to you know I want I want to do that one thing, but unless you take the whole package, that's wrong. And so so th this chapter is about the the. the the total package of, of Christian marriage. Uh, he goes on, Christianity teaches that marriage is for life. And so uh, that's, that's another, uh, one of his other entering arguments here. Now, with respect to, uh, we talked uh, a few weeks ago about the four cardinal virtues. Prudence, temperance, justice, and courage. So justice is what he's going to talk about now in the context of marriage. Um, justice, as I said before, includes the keeping of promises. The duty of keeping that promise, which is our marriage vows, has no special connection with sexual morality. It is in the same position as any other promise. So now now he's he's what he's saying is that you know when you when you take your your wedding vows that's a promise and it's it's really uh, completely separate for from the uh, uh, the physical aspects of marriage. Um, 
the idea that being in love, which he has in quotes there, uh, being in love is the only reason for remaining married really leaves no room for marriage as a contract or promise at all. Now, have you ever uh, heard people talk about this that, you know, well, I, I, I just fell out of love with this person and therefore we got a divorce. You may be, I've, I've heard that, you know, people, people say that before. So, so he's making the point here that, that w with, you know, our, our marriage vows, that's a, that's a, a solemn promise. And as a function of justice, we need to honor that promise. But there are people that believe that. Yeah, that they fall out of love. My first husband did. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can't imagine anybody. Just came to me one day, day and said, I just don't want to be married anymore. Of course, yeah. he was already chasing after somebody else. So, okay. Um, I, bring that, I bring that up when I'm counseling before I married people that. Um, we we have an idea in the West that we fall in love and get married. Mm -hmm. We're the only ones to do that. Um, in that, the Bible does not teach that we fall in love and get married. We can get married for all kinds of reasons. Right, right. But once we have done it, the Bible gives us strict instructions yep. that we are to love each other. Right. You make it happen. Right. As a, as a matter of choice. But of course, I go into it a lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> right, but that's, that's the good summary. Um, so again, so, so Lewis is, is, is speaking counter to the idea that, you know, well, if I no longer feel that I'm in love, then, then I'm going to pull the plug here. Um, now, right in the middle of page 107, there's a sentence as Chesterton pointed out, those who are in love have a natural inclination to bind themselves by promises. So, do you, anybody know who he's referring to? G.K. Chesterton? He was a essayist. You, you heard him? Yeah. yeah, smart he's, guy. He's, hard, he's harder to read than. Yeah, yeah, he is. <laughs> yeah, I'm not smart enough to read much of these. Me neither. <laughs> G.K. Chesterton. You ever see the, those. Uh, the Father Brown mysteries on TV. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He he's that's his creation was Father Brown. Oh, that's <coughs> yeah. um, but uh, you know those who are in love have a natural inclination to bind themselves with promises. And uh, uh, somewhere in here he talks about you know poetry and love songs. You know there's these this promise upon promise upon promise. You know so. So Chesterton, Chesterton's observation is that, you know, when you're in love, you know, it's a very natural thing to, to promise uh, fidelity, etc. Um, and of course, the promise made when I am in love, and because I am in love, to be true to the beloved as long as I live, commits me to being true even if I cease to be in love. Okay, just like. Uh, Ron was saying, a promise must be about things we can do about actions. No one can promise to go on feeling in a certain way. That's that's. And if you didn't know it, you you well you knew it, but uh, you know, Lewis states it very explicitly for us. I find it quite profound that supposedly because of COVID and everybody staying at home, that lots of marriages have ended because there's too much togetherness. Now let's go back into the 1800s when you didn't have a neighbor next door and you raised a farm and it was just you and your spouse and your kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, they survived in the, that era, so why can't we today? Well, they were too busy to they were, do anything. Else. They were out laboring instead of watching <laughs> Father Brown on TV. I guess I'm so sick of hearing, you know, you know and about people can't ma make it because they're spending too much time together. Yeah, yeah. There's other things you can do inside the home, away from each other, that take you. You, you know, yeah. that, that we're going to segue right into that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what it may be asked 
is the use of keeping two people together if they are no longer in love. <coughs> there are several sound social reasons, and one of them is to provide a home for their children. Uh, also, he lists to protect the woman who was probably sac who has probably sacrificed or damaged her own career by getting married from being dropped whenever the man gets tired of her. I think that a big uh, reason for so many divorces is the woman working. I thoroughly, thoroughly believe that if the women had stayed home where I personally think they should have been, mm -hmm. that there would be less marriages. And in the olden days, your parents put up with a lot of stuff. They didn't run out the door and get a divorce the first time there was an argument, a disagreement, yeah, yeah. and they've made it so easy mm -hmm. that, hey, I'm fed up with this, I'll go get a divorce, why, I'm in cap, what's that word? In cap, in no. Incompatibility. I couldn't even think <laughs> I didn't even get it. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um. Well, you have that concept and then you have the man at work and comes home to the wife who's at home with the kids, who's not worldly enough and doesn't understand what's going on in society, who doesn't meet his need, of, you know. So he could, he gets wandering in the workplace for somebody that meets his right. expectations. It all boils yeah. down to sin. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna jump to the bottom of page 108. But as I said before, the most dangerous thing you can do is to take any one impulse of our own nature and set it up as the thing you ought to follow at all costs. Now he has made this point before, and this is another another thing to ponder because you know it can apply in in oh so many ways. Um, and I'm drawing a blank here as an example, but. Um, uh, but if you if you just focus on one particular thing without without kind of having a balanced approach, then then you can get a little bit out of whack. Um, it, well, let's just take the four virtues: prudence, temperance, justice, and courage. If if you are obsessed with justice. You know, you can just kind of imagine some vigilante type person. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna execute justice because that's the only thing I can think about, and it should be balanced with other things as well. Um, being in love is a good thing, but it is not the best thing. Um, so now, like in Middle of page 109, I think we're going to get to what Linda was alluding to a minute ago. Love in the second sense, love as distinct from being in love, okay, we're drawing a distinction there, is not merely a feeling. It is a deep unity maintained by the will and deliberately strengthened by habit. Okay, back to habit. You know, we were talking about that just recently. Um, and again, it, this love is reinforced in Christian marriages by the grace which both partners ask and receive from God. So, um, obviously, um, you wives know about needing grace to deal with your husband. There she is. Yeah. Yay. Um, so, uh, but I think, you know, you, you, most of you would probably agree that... I like that, that next sentence. What's that? <laughs> they can have this love for each other even, even at those moments when they do not like each other. <laughs> and you love yourself even when you do not like yourself. <laughs> yeah, that can happen. Yep. Well, actually, that's... There are times that you really get mad at your husband or wife. But to me, you don't start loving... I don't know. Well, but that's but, but again, th there are there are folks who are who are susceptible to falling out of love, and this is these are words that should encourage <coughs> them to. And we all have our ups and downs. We have our little spats. Mm -hmm. and, you know, but we still love each other. What the doctor is saying. Right. You don't stop loving. 
know, you don't stop loving them. You just get mad and then you get glad. That's it. <laughs> yeah, after 50 years, you're bound to him. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> okay, so um, um, near the bottom of page 109, being in love, and of course he keeps putting this in quote, quotation, being in love first moved them to promise fidelity. Okay, and you just, you know, picture the newlyweds enamored with each other and uh, promising fidelity. But now he's, what, what he's going to talk about is moving past, you know, being, being wrapped up with this person and, uh, you know, all that gooeyness that we feel, you know, uh, when we first meet somebody. Um, and he talks about the quieter love. This quieter love enables them to keep the promise. Okay, and I think that's kind of what you were talking about a minute ago, right, Linda? That's, you know, we kind of moving past um, all this giddiness of being in love and, and it becomes much deeper. Lewis re refers to it as a quieter love. Uh, and that's what enables them to keep the promise of their marital vows. It is on this love that the engine of marriage is run. Okay, that's this quieter love is what what keeps the train moving down the highway, down the down the tracks. Okay. But then the end of the sentence is being in love was the explosion that started it. And uh, you know, I think that's a pretty this pretty good description as well, that you know it 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 takes, you know, being in love to, um, to cause you to make this commitment to the other person. But then once that giddiness tends to fade away, you know, you need this quieter love to, to, uh, to keep everything in motion. That's true love, just like how Jesus loves, <coughs> true love, you know, that you are willing to sacrifice, you know, for your husband or for your mm -hmm. kids. Right. You know, you do whatever it takes. You know, sometimes you don't feel like cooking, but you know, I, you know, he's hungry, so you have to cook. Because being here, you know, before I know that sometimes Ben would like the way we cook, you know, yeah. the Philippines, and I had to cook sometimes two different kinds for the kids and oh, yeah, yeah, for, right. for oh, us. Yeah. <laughs> because he See, that's, that's why you need that, yeah. that extra measure yeah. of grace. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but, but sometimes, like, is not true. <laughs> but sometimes, like, Sunday, yeah. like, we decided we were going to go out to eat after church, and we normally go to Cochran's, and he leans over, he goes, let's go to Bing and Bird, I go, that's what I was thinking. Or we'll ride from down here at Cedar Creek Lake all the way to Arlington and won't say two words to one another. <laughs> We're looking out the window, he's listening to the radio, you know. But we, doesn't mean we don't like each other, it's just we're quietly in love. There you go, there you go. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent example. <laughs> uh, top of page 110. Uh, our experience... But that's you as you get. Uh, that is the, 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 the way our thought processes work. Our experience is colored through and through by books and plays and the cinema, and it takes patience and skill to disentangle the things we have really learned from life for ourselves. So I, I think his point there is that, um, uh, well, <laughs> sometimes Laura has the, uh, the Hallmark Channel on, I love the Hallmark. <laughs> I love it. But, but see, that illustrates the whole being, you know, falling in love yes. thing, right? Yes. But it's but it's not the, you know, it's that you know they they meet for the first time and oh yeah and. Uh, awesome. <laughs> Isn't that the man hating channel? Well, I don't I don't I don't watch much of it. <laughs> uh, but um, but of course, now on the Hallmark Channel. You know, everyone is perfect. 
you know, whether it's a home or a business, the street, it is perfect. You know, there are no smudges on the window, there's no dirt on the floor, there's no litter in the street. It is perfect. No homeless shelter. Uh, yeah, that's, that's right. right. Or you know, anything. The honesty is, is that they're not perfect, and that here they are, they, they meet, and it's only an hour or something, but you know, they, even if it's supposed to be weeks, everything is fine. And then they look around the corner and see their supposed perfect part hugging somebody else. And they say, well, forget it and go home. They don't even bother to ask, you know. And then, because it's Hallmark, something happens and somebody tells them, oh, you know, that's, that's, that's his sister or whatever. Right. And, and then they come back together. But, you know. I mean, we should. You watch. You watch. I think we're watching way too much. We were dating. How do we get through all this without having this little tragedy to overcome? But but see that 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 makes the point that he's saying here that you know you know uh, things like the Hallmark Channel or books or movies really present a a very narrow and distorted picture of real life. Well, well, yeah, that that, that is unrealistic. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I think he does make a good, uh, uh, well, you know, because when we're younger, you know, we go through that unrealistic expectations. Mm -hmm. And supposedly by maturing and experiencing real life, we, we temper our expectations so it is, you know, it is more to, to real life and to take more caution. You know, a lot of what God wants us to do is be led mm -hmm. and not and not so much, um, you know, trying everything. And, uh, and it's, uh, we can get in trouble with um, unrealistic expectations. Okay, so uh, now we're still in this, He's still talking about this quieter kind of love. Uh, the dying away of the first thrill will be compensated for by a quieter and more lasting kind of interest. And he, now he's just talking about, you know, career choices and stuff like that. <clears throat> what is more, and I can hardly find words to tell you how important I think this is, it is just the people who are ready to submit to the loss of the thrill and settle down to the sober interest, who are then more likely to meet new thrills in some quite different direction. He gives an example. The man who has learned to fly and becomes a good pilot will suddenly discover music. The man who has settled down to live in the beauty spot will discover gardening. So in, in, in previously they talked about, you know, the boy who wants to, to be a pilot, you know, and there's the thrill of it. And, um, but, you know, as, as this person develops a, a, a skill set like this and gets better at it and better at it and does it repeatedly and, you know, over and over and over again, has more training, etc., cetera, um, you know, that, that some of that thrill is gone, but then he's, because it requires less focus, say, to know that to do some of these tasks then he kind of frees him up to do other things then he's saying you know there's a parallel within marriage that as as time goes by and some of that thrill diminishes then you then you learn more about the other person etc it is simply no good trying to keep the thrill that is the very worst thing you can do let the thrill go let it die away Go on through that period of death into the quieter interest and happiness that follow, and you will find you are living in a world of new thrills all the time. Okay, so so he's he's coaching us here that maybe the, the, the maybe maybe we needed to hear the coaching a long time ago, you know. As but as the as the thrill of your of your marriage, you know, might subside a little bit, then it should be taken. Other things should should take the, take its place, and that should be a natural progression. And uh, and I think there's a lot of wisdom there. 
Uh, it is because so few people understand this that you find many middle-aged men and women maundering about their lost youth at the very age when new horizons ought to be appearing and new doors opening all around them. So the same sort of thing, you know, where, uh, you know, if you think, well, I've, I'm, the thrill is gone, I must no longer be in love and I'm going to go somewhere else. Well, no. Let the thrill fade away because if you simply go pursuing that thrill, um, I've met these people, you know, they have three or four ex-wives. So I think they were pursuing the thrill and, uh, and it just led to, to heartache, not in- Let me go get Jim. <laughs> Just kidding. So uh, he also talks about, uh, he expresses the opinion that, you know, perhaps there should be two types of marriage. That is a, a uh, you know, a, a marriage set in a church where we make our vows before God. You know that group of people would be held to a, a different standard than like a civil union. You know, married at the at the at the courthouse. And they raise up different types of kids. <laughs> That's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but of course, this is in the context of, of divorce. Okay, he uh, has a couple of a uh, couple more pages, and uh, I think we're going to do okay. Christian wives promise to obey their husbands. In Christian marriage, the man is said to be the head. Okay, you remember that from, from your vows, perhaps. So the first question is, why should there be a head at all? Why not just equality between the two? And then the next question is, why should it be the man? And he, he, he answers these questions. Uh, with respect to, you know, why do you need to have a head of the home at all? He says, if marriage is permanent, one or other party must, in the last resort, have the power of deciding the family policy. But that's God's plan, you know, man, and then you, a woman, you know, you're under the umbrella of God's protection. And if you get away from that, then you expect trouble because there'll be temptation everywhere. But if you are under God's protection, you know, marriage in the church, then the man that's how he put an order we have to obey right. how god had instituted uh, and, and i and i think what lewis is trying to do is to to explain why the policy works and that is that you cannot have a permanent association without a constitution so it's it's just you know he's explaining how the order that god gave us has a has a valid function to it and then then the next question is, if there is a head, why would it be the man? God created him first. <laughs> there must be something unnatural about the rule of wives over husbands, says C.S. Lewis. Because the wives... <laughs> because the wives themselves are half ashamed of it, and despise the husbands whom they rule. Now I'm just gonna not comment on that. <laughs> uh, we, we call we call that in our language under the sire. You mean you are under the skirt? You know, if a, a guy doesn't stand up and is not the head of the family, yeah, we call them under the sire. Women uh, under the skirt. Oh, okay, under. <laughs> yeah, under the skirt. Yeah. Yeah. The relations of the family to the outer world. Now, you know, just think of your family as a unit, and, and we, we deal with the rest of the world in various ways. Lewis refers to that as our foreign policy. Must depend in the last resort upon the man, because he always ought to be, and usually is, much more just to the outsiders. A woman is primarily fighting for her own children and husband against the rest of the world. So he's, he's pointing out how, because women have the protective, nurturing nature, that it's, it's better that they not go and confront uh, 
the neighbor with the loud dog or something, you know, because the husband, Lewis says, will be more just in, women, in dealing with them. Women are more emotional, I think. That's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that, that covers it all. Yeah, right. I think. Well, isn't it true in any organization that you want the best people doing certain jobs? Mm -hmm. And I was a computer programmer and, and, and very good at it, but I didn't know anything about running a bank. And, uh, you know, and when we got married, I, I had had to deal with people when I had my own team. And I realized you assign work based on what they can do right. and what you can do and what you got time for. I got into one problem where I realized I had saved all the hard parts of this big project I was doing because I thought I should <coughs> take that on because I was getting paid more than the other people. But the thing was, I was also going to all these meetings and doing other things, and I realized, boy, all this easy stuff is done, and all the hard stuff is just on my desk, and so I started, I learned how to delegate. Right, right. And, and so, you know, and, and, you know, every place I've been, there have been different levels of who should be doing what. Yep. And, and yep. So you have to learn to adjust, and so every family should come out the way that family works. Mm -hmm. I mean, Carol for 40 years worked in the bank and she went from being a gopher all the way up to a vice president. And so, you know, I came in and I wrote programs for them, but that had nothing to do with finances. So the finances, you know, I have delegated to her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering when you're gonna get that. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about forgiveness now. <laughs> That's the way she told me to phrase it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, forgiveness. Um, I said on a previous chapter that chastity was the most unpopular of the Christian virtues. But he thinks forgiveness may actually be less popular than uh, unchastity or chastity. Um, the Christian rule is, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Because in Christian morals, thy neighbor includes thy enemy. And so we come up against this terrible duty of forgiving our enemies. So we forgive you, Russia. <laughs> <laughs> They're our enemy. Uh, well, I think this has to do with person to person. Let's see. <laughs> Everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. <laughs> we all know that. Um, and then, then he goes on. Uh, again, this was written during World War II. And half of you already want to ask me, I wonder how you'd feel about forgiving the Gestapo if you were a Pole or a Jew. There you go. And, and he says that he, you know, he he wonders how he would do that himself. Because that's, well, she did it. She did well, it we're, we're many years out now, and we've had books written about that, yep. and people who have yeah. had to face some of the people that. That's true. Yeah. So. Uh, um, but they gave uh, Whoopi a, a detention from the show because she said some unfavorable things about the Holocaust. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Okay, but he, he, is, he does make the point that he is, he is talking about what Christianity is. He says, I forgot, um, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. <clears throat> there is no slightest suggestion that we are offered forgiveness on any other terms. You know, again, we as, we as Baptists, you know, we don't recite the, the Lord's Prayer as part of our service. You know, it's, it's rare that we even, you know, except perhaps in your own personal devotions that you even uh, think about it. But it is very explicit. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So, I mean, Lewis makes the point. Um, it is made perfectly clear that if we do not forgive, we shall not be forgiven. And that there are no two ways about it. So, so this, this is serious stuff that our forgiveness can hinge upon how well we uh, forgive others. 
So uh, the next thing he says is, you know, don't, don't try to forgive the Gestapo. You know, try with your husband or your wife or, or someone else your, uh, you, you, that, that has offended you somehow and, you know, start on a smaller scale and, and practice some forgiveness and, and you know, leave, leave the, the, the bigger things for later. Um, we must try to understand exactly what loving your neighbor as yourself means. I do not exactly get a feeling of fondness or affection for myself, and I do not even always enjoy my own society. So apparently, love your neighbor does not mean feel fond of him or find him attractive. So in much the same way that we can, uh, you know, look at ourselves and think, well, you're a bit of a reprobate, you know, which, but, but we still are, we still love ourselves, even when we're not very likable. Um, self-love makes me, uh, my self-love makes me think myself nice but thinking myself nice is not why I love myself. Okay. Um, in my most clear-sighted moments, not only do I not think myself a nice man, but I know that I am a very nasty one. I can look at some of the things I have done with horror and loathing. So apparently I am allowed to loathe and hate some of the things my enemies do. So if I can, I know I know the kind of person I am, and uh, okay, so I can I can love myself. So likewise, other people who have have their own set of deficiencies, I should be able to love them in much the same way. Um, but year but years later, it occurred to me that there was one man to whom I had been doing this all my life. Oh, let me, sorry, back up one sentence. I must hate the man's bad actions, but not hate the bad man, or as they would say, hate the sin, but not the sinner. And of course, we've all heard that uh, many times. But years later, it occurred to me that there was one man to whom I had been doing this all my life, namely myself. However much I might dislike my own cowardice or conceit or greed, I went on loving myself. There had never been the slightest difficulty about it. In fact, the very reason why I hated the things that I... Sorry. In fact, the very reason why I hated the things was that I loved the man. Just because I loved myself, I was sorry to find that I was the sort of man who did those things. Consequently, Christianity does not want us to reduce by one atom the hatred we feel for cruelty and treachery. We ought to hate them. Okay, so I love myself in spite of the deficiencies I have, so just extend that towards other people. Um... But it does not want us to hate them in the same way in which we hate things in ourselves. Being sorry that the man should have done such things and hoping, if it were any way possible, that somehow, sometime, somewhere, he can be cured and made human again. Okay? So, uh, the, the, the old adage that we've heard so often, uh, hate the sin but love the sinner, you know, that's, you know, C.S. Lewis explains how that works here, and that's how we ought to live our lives. Um, does loving your enemy mean not punishing him? No. And he goes, he goes on to uh, like give the example of, a, of a, like a criminal case. You know, so essentially, if you're on a jury, the thing not to do is to say, "Well, I'm just I'm a Christian, and I'm not going to, you know, judge that person." Well, that's Lewis has said, no, it's it's correct to to, uh, uh, to bring justice toward that person. Um, 
What I cannot understand is the sort of semi-pacifism you get nowadays, which gives people the idea that though you have to fight, now again, the context is, is wartime, uh, though you have to fight, you ought to do it with a long face and as if you were ashamed of it. It is that feeling that robs lots of magnificent young Christians in the services <laughs> of something they have a right to, something which is the natural accompaniment of courage, a kind of gaiety and wholeheartedness. So it's, you know, he's, he's speaking directly to many people in his audience who were on active duty in wartime that, uh, you, you know, yes, that is our enemy, but it is appropriate for you to, uh, to engage them as, as required. Remember Christians, uh, remember we Christians like Sorry. Remember, we Christians think man lives forever. Therefore, what really matters are those little marks or twists on the central inside part of our soul, which are going to turn in the long run into a heavenly or a hellish creature. So this goes back, uh, it was last week or the week before, where he talks about the, you know, the inner person that does the choosing. And, and he, he uh, gave us the idea that when we, when we make correct choices, then, then that inner person gets aligned properly as it should, and that leads us in a heavenly direction. That is, we become more fit for heaven. But if we continuously make wrong choices, that inner person gets twisted up, and uh, not so much of a... Uh, in, in war, you know, you have to kill your enemy. I mean, even in the Old Testament, when Jesus, I mean, when God told the Israelites, you have to wipe them out, you have to destroy all of them. They made a sin when they lived a few, right, right. because then it corrupted, you know, the, the way they lived later on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me, you know, when it comes to principle, like on, in war, you know, you yeah. have to, you don't want to, it, it's um, during peace time, but mm -hmm. during war, I think you have, you have to do it. Okay. It's like the, in World War One when, the, when they were in the trenches and the holiday came around, they got together and celebrated the holiday, German and American. And yeah. And when the, that was over, everybody back to yep. the trenches were back at war. Yeah, yeah, that was a <coughs> unique situation. I okay, we have to one, share one oh. thing. Of, um, I had Danny Dot come in to talk to my sixth grade girls who in his life, uh, uh, and he was talking about, uh, and it's specifically we wanted him to talk about the war. Mm -hmm. And he indicated that when it got down to the end of the war that the Germans were putting 12 and 13 year old boys with rifles in their hands and he started weeping mm -hmm. and he said and I had to kill them yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 because it brought the war to an end yeah, yeah. that he killed them or they killed him yeah, right. yeah. horrible that's, choice that's horrible. Mm -hmm. but it broke his heart mm -hmm. to do that okay so the final uh, paragraph I admit that this means loving people who have nothing lovable about them. Perhaps it makes it easier if we remember that is how he, capital H, loves you, or loves us. Not for any nice, attractive qualities we think we have, but just because we are the things called selves. For really, there is nothing else in us to love. Creatures like us who actually find hatred such a pleasure that to give it up is like giving up beer or tobacco. Referring to hatred as a as a uh, an addictive behavior, like other things. Next week, uh, chapter eight is titled "The Great Sin," so uh, that that chapter is worth reading. And uh, what the great sin is, I'll give you a preview, is, is pride. And uh, 
serious, it's a very serious chapter. Um, but we, what we, what we want is humility to, to counteract our flesh. He did pretty good never to have been married before. Did he ultimately yeah. get married? Yes. I yes. thought he did. Yeah, yes, and that's... He did. Uh, the, but at the time of this writing, he was not. Uh, the movie uh, about that is titled Shadowlands, which is very good. Okay. Did he ever have children? Uh, none of his own. No. I think it was... But he did take care of his stepson. Yeah, a couple, one or two stepsons. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any other thoughts before we go? God is good. Thank you so much for attending. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. <laughs> our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for our time together. And I do pray, Lord, that you would uh, uh, make us able to forgive. Uh, uh, show us how that uh, we can best uh, love the sinner and uh, hate the sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> No. Mm -hmm. Stay later, but somebody changed the time. I thought it was. <laughs>